Hi everybody, I'm Mick, and we are here for worship. It's the first time that we're trying to broadcast live on Facebook, and um, hopefully we made the proper adjustments last night in our couple of test runs, and um, well, we'll see where it goes from here. Uh, I thank you for being with us, and um, Sharia's here for music. We've got a couple, a few people here with us, mostly just those who are involved in the service, and as you can see, the candles are being lit and prepared now. Um, we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, be safe. That's it. Just forget the couple of announcements. Um, be safe. All um, meetings uh, save the uh, Wednesday service, or the, excuse me, not service, the Wednesday Lenten gathering. Uh, we will continue to have that because we have some so few people attending that and we have a room big enough We can spread out. So Wednesday night. We're still here for that Lenten series um, For those of you who have been with us for the past couple of weeks I would say if you haven't been with us for the past couple of weeks um, We'll run that again for you. Okay, don't worry about Bob getting these last two um, Other than that God bless Let us worship together Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Father, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Remembering the account we must all when they give, let us humbly confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly thank us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Merciful God, the fountain of living water, 
You quench our thirst and wash away our sins. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows from the beauty of your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Because the thirsty Israelites quarreled with Moses and put God to the test, Moses cried out in desperation to God. God commanded Moses to strike the rock to provide water for the people. The doubt-filled question, is the Lord among us or not, received a very positive answer. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on that rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Mm -hmm. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Mer Meribah, because of the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 95th Psalm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you made it. And your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Oh, that today you would hear God's voice. Harden not your hearts, as in Meribah, but as on that day at Massa in the desert. There your ancestors tested me, they put me to the test, though they had not seen my works. Forty years I loathed that generation, saying, The heart of this people goes astray, they do not know my ways. Indeed, I swore in my anger, they shall never come to my rest. Though we often hear that God helps those who help themselves, here Paul tells us that through Jesus' death, God helps utterly helpless sinners. Since we who had been enemies are reconciled to God in the cross, we now live in hope for our final salvation. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our suffering, 
knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we are still we're sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely have, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, 
I am He, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do not say four months more and, the, the, and then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I have sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts always, always be in our hearts and mind. Lord, Father, we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Please be seated. I hate messing up words that I've said every single week for how long? Oh. I like this, this gospel, even though it is a long one to read in church. Um, and many of you may be sitting at home in your pajamas right now hearing the gospel read in a service for the first time in your pajamas. Unlike Max Klein, who probably hears it weekly in his pajamas. No, I'm just kidding. The gospel is important for us today. There's a really important lesson for this woman, this Samaritan at the well. And this lesson is just as important for us. Jesus meets this Samaritan woman and he speaks to her. This was not supposed to happen for many reasons. Last week, we heard the story of Nicodemus, a respected Jewish leader um, Jesus was in Judea, around Jerusalem. And, and if you think of Israel, uh, sort of like the state of New Jersey, okay? Uh, say Jesus was down around Philadelphia, okay? And he was going to New York, all right? The most direct way would be a straight line. Well, in Israel at the time of Christ, that would have been straight through Samaria. But Jews and Samaritans at the time, they didn't get along very well at all, okay? It stems from the time when there was a break in the two, in two separate kingdoms, and um, the northern kingdom fell first to the Assyrians, and, and they went, and they were exiled, and they, they intermarried, and, well, when the, when the uh, remnant came back, or when the remnant was already there, and, and there was all this intermarrying, the Samaritans, the northern kingdom, set up uh, worship someplace else other than Jerusalem, okay? Well, the southern kingdom, Judea, uh, they didn't fall until later on, and, and they considered what the Samaritans had done to be polluting of the true religion, the 
true Jewish faith that was given to them by God. So there was this animosity always. So if you picture New Jersey, and you picture Jesus going from Philadelphia to New York, um, to go all the way over to the Atlantic seaboard in order to get up to New York instead of, uh, instead of taking a straight line. Well, that's what they would have normally done in Israel, okay? And it's from going from Jerusalem to Galilee, they would have gone over to the Jordan, okay? They would have traveled east along the Jordan Valley. It would have avoided Samaria altogether. But instead, Jesus and his disciples, they go up through Samaria, a place they weren't supposed to be. Jesus sends his uh, disciples off to go get something because it's around noon and they've been traveling hard and, well, they're tired. He's at this well. The disciples go into the closest town to start uh, acquiring uh, some food items. Well, this woman comes up. The woman wasn't supposed to be there. It's noon. Women in villages at that time would gather water in the cool of the day, either in the morning or in the evening. They would have come to the well, this well, together. It would have been a time of socializing, of, of gossiping about what was happening in the village. It would have been a time for them to share with each other but here's this woman. This woman is alone. It's noon. It's the, the heat of the day. And, and she's a Samaritan. And there's this, this Jew standing there. And he starts talking to her. It was unheard of at the time. So we have last week's message where Jesus is meeting with uh, Nicodemus in, in the middle of the night. And now this week we have Jesus meeting with probably who was the direct opposite of Nicodemus, a female Samaritan there in the middle of the day. And they get into this conversation and they start talking about, Jesus gets, says, give me something to drink. And sir, I, you know, how is it that you, you're speaking to me, a woman of Samaria? And, and he she says to him, I see you have no bucket, and because he comes back with her and says, if you had the water that I had for you, this living water that I have for you, you would never be thirsty. And she comes back and says, sir, give me this water, because whatever you have for me that I don't have to keep coming back to this well, oh, I would want that very much. But you have no bucket? What are you talking about? Well, first of all, you kind of have to know something about living water and what this well was. Living water was moving water, a river, a stream, a creek, something like that, okay? That was what was meant by that term. This was a deep well, possibly over 100 feet deep, an old well. They knew this well from the time of Abraham. It was a well that collected rainwater and dew. It wasn't really a living well water in the way that Jesus was talking about, or the way that she would have assumed he was talking about. So she says, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming here. Oh, if you really knew what I was talking about. But I'll tell you what, go and get your husband, and you come back, and I'll give you this water, okay? And she says, I have no husband. Well, you are right, Jesus says back to her. You've had five husbands. And the guy we're shacking up with now, he really can't be called your husband, can he? So you have spoken the truth. And she recognizes something right there. Now, what must she have been feeling at that point? Well, she was at the well at midday, away from the other women. The, she was there because she was fearful. Okay, I imagine that she was fearful of... of what the community says about her, knowing her past, knowing her present situation. She probably didn't want to um, want to hear the snide remarks of the other women getting the water. Only too aware of her own reputation in town, she didn't need, really need to be reminded of it. So she was probably fearful of what people were saying. She was anxious 
about probably having to be there at midday. It's the heat of the day. And she's had to interrupt her flow of doing other chores to come walk out to this well to get the water to go back. She probably was uncertain about her future. She had already had five husbands. And what about the guy she's with now? Her world was not right. Okay? In this encounter, however, she comes back. And she talks to Jesus and she starts getting into this dialogue with him. You choose. You say that it's not right for us to worship here, that we have to go to Jerusalem to worship. Why is that? That's the biggest hang-up. That's the stuff that you have against us. And Jesus comes back and says, the time is coming, now it's here. Well, you will neither worship on this mountain or that mountain, but you will worship in spirit and truth. It's God is spirit. And she recognizes something in him, not only because she told him, or because Jesus told her uh, about the secrets that she was keeping, recognizing him as a prophet, but then, but then she recognizes something else. And maybe she gets this hint, and she goes, "Okay, I can see you're, you know, you're a teacher, you're, you're a prophet. Tell me this, then. We are told that we are waiting for Messiah." And Jesus rocks her little world right there. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Now, first of all, anybody who ever claims that Jesus never actually claimed to be the Messiah, read this part of scripture, okay? Because that is an absolute out-and-out -out claim. I am. That should all sound familiar to you. I am. The one you've been waiting for. I am here. I am with you. It's going to be okay. Now, I don't know where she ever heard or where, what religious training she ever had in her background, but somehow she knew from her past, something in her past, that, that told her about worshiping uh, and waiting for the Messiah. And she starts to recognize. And the story goes on to say she, she left her water jars there and she runs back to, to her community, no longer really, well, maybe still afraid, but willing to put those fears aside for a moment and gather everybody up and say, and, and tell them, this is what I've heard. This is the man that I've seen. This is the things that he's told me. Could it really be him? And they come out. <laughs> she was compelled to tell other people. Once she had this encounter, she would never walk away from it the exact same way again. Somehow she was able to put away her fear about being in front of people, the anxiety that she felt. Could it be that her world was being set right again? In this time that, well, that we're worshiping this way, in this time that the schools have been shut down for a while, in this time that travel has been restricted, in this time that we're told to take very special precautions, in this time of uncertainty, we are certainly unsure about our futures. Where is this virus going to lead? Where does it go from here? Are, are we only shut down for the next three weeks, or... Is it going to be even longer than that? What's going to happen economically? All these places shutting down. What's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my family if I can't afford to, to pay my bills? What's going to happen? So there's a lot of fear and anxiety right now. I don't need to, to prove it any more than to tell you, look at the news. Look what's happening right now in grocery stores and Sam's clubs and all these all over the place. There's fear, anxiety. Insert your own joke here about toilet paper if you want to. That's fine, but there's a lot of fear. But we too should 
should really think about this story, the Samaritan woman remembering the things that she was taught in her past and, and bringing it forward in her mind with this encounter with Jesus. We are told to wait for the Messiah. You too should be bringing to your thoughts the stuff that you've been taught about God. Yeah, this is a fearful time and we're anxious about things and everything, but what do you know about God? You know that God so loves us that he sent his son. You know that there is nothing that you and I could ever do that would separate God's love from us. You know that whenever we mess up, and when we do mess up, that there is forgiveness in the grace of God. You know that God promises us that there is, there is a plan for us, and we may not know it now, because we have these human minds and we're trying to understand the mind of God and, and we won't ever truly. But he says, fear not. How many times did Jesus enter a room or an angel comes and gives a message to somebody and the first words are, do not be afraid. Yeah, it's easy for me to say, right? Do not be afraid. The time and a time Time and time again, when he tells us that, I think God knows how fearful we really are of all kinds of things. We too should remember what we have been taught. Like the woman at the well was compelled once she had this interaction with Christ, she was compelled to go and tell other people, you know what, Christian, go tell people. Tell people, yeah, this is a scary time. But it's okay. God's got this. He loves us. And there's nothing on earth, no, no power seen or unseen that could separate his love from us. Tell him. Because I think the world really, really needs to hear that right now. Bring to your mind the things that you have been promised by God. Bring to your mind, ask God to bring to your mind the scripture verses that speak to you about this, that bring you comfort, solace, even in the midst of all kinds of paper product shortages, okay? For me, Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God bless you all in this time of uncertainty. But don't worry. You know who you belong to. And he's got this. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. now we use the words of the Apostles' Creed to reaffirm our faith every time we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of living water, strengthen our voices that all people can know and believe that Jesus is truly the Savior of the world. We pray for the people of Trinity Lutheran Church in Millsburg and the Reverend F. Lorraine Sundin. We pray for our bishops, Craig and Wayne, for Pastor Mick, for all ministers, and for your entire church. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Merciful God, open the hearts of leaders and authorities that they hear the cries of the, and the suffering and act with compassion toward them. Bring peace to disputed lands and bring reconciliation to people divided by race, culture, or nationality. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our Savior, grant peace and protection to those who serve in our armed forces especially those serving in harm's way in places far from home. We remember especially those suffering from the wounds of war in body, mind, or spirit, for healing and for hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Faithful God, mend the hearts of those who grieve broken relationships, whether by the lack of understanding, conflict, abuse, divorce, or death. Draw near to all who are ill, Assure those questioning your presence in the midst of doubt or suffering. We pray for those listed on our parish prayer list and those whose names we speak in the silence of our heart or aloud at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever present God, renew us in the promise of baptism. Join us together in worship, fellowship, and sharing your good news. Give us the courage to defend our faith. Embolden us to proclaim the good news as we serve others and work for justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We ask you to heal those who are infected with the coronavirus, to protect those who are well, and to prevent its spread. We ask you to bless and protect the caretakers and medical personnel and everyone on the front lines trying to help. We pray for the scientists who are working on vaccines. For those who've lost loved ones, we ask you to comfort and heal their hearts. Infuse us with courage and faith to overcome our fears and open our awareness to your healing presence that always, always, surrounds us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of living water, we thank you for those who endured suffering and who now boast in the glory of God. Pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts and give us peace as we live in the hope of our salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you who are here, and those at home, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Normally at this time is when we give the, the passing of peace. Now, there's ways to do that which in our modern time we have to be more respectful. God's peace to you and your family and to all of you here. God bless you. And uh, we're going to go into Holy Communion. How we're going to do it this morning is that uh, I am, at, after setting on the table and everything, I will be using uh, lots of Purell up here. Um, maybe we should consider putting a liturgical uh, position in the Purell bearer. <laughs> How's that? That may be a part of our future from now on. Who knows? I'm also going to ask everyone who is going to receive communion here. Um, to also, we have hand sanitizer on the, on the sides of the pews. Um, so they're going to purify their hands as well before they receive communion. Um, I am going to consecrate both elements at this service. 
I will be consuming all the wine myself. Okay. Now I know Ken I team is about to make a joke about that right now. Keep it to yourself, Ken. Um, it's just for safety's sake. So we won't be distributing the wine this morning, um, but we will be distributing the host. Now, receiving any one part of Holy Communion is as receiving the whole. Okay? And I also had a, a very respected bishop in, in seminary who, who instructed me about something. He said, if you are going to take communion to somebody who is intubated, uh, or, or for some reason they can't physically take the host from you. That if they intend, when you present it, they intend to take it, they have received Holy Communion. Sort of like the intention of the heart. You know? Well, I know it's not possible in this form to receive Holy Communion in a physical way, but I believe it is still possible through God, because he tells me all things are possible through him. That for those of you who intend, if you were here, to take Holy Communion, that you too have received. Theologically, whether that's sound or not, I may be a heretic. I don't know. I'll get a call <laughs> from the bishop if, if so. But just take that for what it's worth. All right? Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Every week when it's live, I can't say acceptable. This week, I say it. God bless you all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now in the words our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
couple of interesting little facts. <laughs> the Iran's position is when the priest or pastor is holding his hands out like this for communion. And many times a priest will, uh, or a pastor will hold his fingers in this. Actually, uh, where that came from, or one of the uh, one of the sources I have for where that actually came from, was the priest keeping these two fingers together was so that he would keep these pure to touch the Holy Sacrament. Just interesting stuff that pops into my head during the Holy Sacrament. This is normally the time of service where we um, where we say prayers for people's birthdays or anniversaries or special things that they thank God for. And uh, that shouldn't stop just because we're like this, okay? So if you are celebrating birthday, anniversary, you want to give thanks to God for anything. We'll pray together. Holy and gracious God, Father, you have blessed us in so many different ways. The blessings that we can see before us and those you have yet to reveal. And for those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries or any, anything to give thanks to you for, we celebrate with them. And we thank you that we've been able to share this time together. So our Father, continue to bless them, watch over them, guide them, and guard them. For these and the years of celebrations ahead. Father, we pray this all in Christ's holy name. Amen. I do want to say one more thing. This is a perfect opportunity now that we do have a service on Facebook. Um, traditional services like this, um, the Mass, uh, Roman Catholic, Episcopal, uh, Lutheran, um, there are fewer and fewer of, this, uh, of churches providing this type of service. And now, uh, every one of my parishioners on, at Emmanuel Lutheran here in Ludington and Grace Episcopal in Ludington, you all now have it on your Facebook feed. If you have told somebody what this service is like, well, now you can actually share it with them too, because we're going to make this public for you so you can do that, okay? Um, again, fewer and fewer places are offering a service like this. Not that there's anything wrong with, with my brothers and sisters who worship in a more, shall we say, contemporary fashion. As I see Max behind camera jumping up and down. Um, that is th this type of orthodoxy or this type of traditional service is getting harder and harder to find. If this is something that speaks to your soul, welcome. Always. Let us pray together the post communion prayer. We thank, thank you, living God, God, for the, for the body and blood of your Son, which, which sustains us in the wilderness and the garden of life. As Christ has loved us in this feast, so send us to love Christ in our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. May the God of forgiveness and peace bless you in the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Unbind you and send you forth. Thank you, God.